Thank you so much. Now, in the spirit of discomfort, and perhaps in recognition that it's 11.30 on a Saturday afternoon, um, I'd like to invite all of you to, if you can, briefly stand up and maybe shake out all that energy that's going on. Thank you so much. This session is going to be about action and the kinds of activities we need to take to truly be able to deliver on the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. My name is Nicola Alexander. I work at Conservation International, where I oversee our restoration portfolio of work. Please, please sit down, or stay standing if you'd like. That's also fine. Um, now, many of you are definitely familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's 1.5 degree report that says in no uncertain terms that we have 10 years to address the effects, well, the, the challenges of climate change to keep emissions in the ground and to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, that 10-year timeline also happens to align very closely with the uh, timeline of the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. The connections between land, biodiversity, and climate are increasingly clear. And if we could just have the uh, PowerPoint up, please. Uh, it'll come along. Um, and so what our opportunity uh, now is to understand the kinds of activities and the kinds of actions we need to take over the next two years in order to be able to deliver on the challenges of the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. This is our preparation phase. We have two years to lay the groundwork to be able to hit that marathon and run it well. And so at Conservation International, we decided to take a look at our history of restoration projects to understand what was successful, what was less successful, in order to prepare for this decade. Um, well, what you would have seen if we had the PowerPoint loaded uh, was a map of 15 different countries where Conservation International has been doing restoration projects for the past uh, 12 years or so. We've done over 30 different projects across those 15 countries, ranging from a couple hundred hectares of agroforestry projects to a couple hundred thousand hectares of savanna restoration uh, in South Africa. And so we took a hard look at what worked in those projects and what didn't work in order to develop recommendations for ourselves, for our partners, and for the water community as to what we should get ready now to deliver on the decade. So to help me go through what some of those recommendations are, I'd like to welcome our amazing panel to uh, the stage. If you, would, if you wouldn't mind joining. And I'm going to quickly introduce all of them. They are incredibly well-established professionals in their field. Their bios are very long and extensive. Uh, we obviously don't have time to go through that right now, but I'd invite you to check them out online. Uh, coming up first is a good friend, Chris Newman. Come on up, Chris. Chris is the co-founder of Sylvan Aqua Farms, which is a regenerative farm in Virginia. He is a member of the band of Chopko Pescatue Indians, hopefully. <laughs> Um, and his farm really embodies the kind of social, ecological, um, and economic transitions that we need to start thinking about in order to turn the agricultural sector into not an engine of destruction, but an agent of restoration. Thank you for being here, Chris. Thanks for taking time on a Saturday away from your farm. Next, we have Jennifer Morris, who is the president of Conservation International um, and a constant inspiration to me. Jen is, has been managing or working at Conservation International for about three decades, manages our 29... <laughs> Never mind, three years, three years. <laughs> three years, manages our 29 country um, initiatives, oversees the 100 plus, 1,000 plus staff that are a part of CI, and I think most relevant to what we're, she's gonna be discussing today, manages and oversees the 2,000 plus partnerships that CI has with organizations from local indigenous communities all the way to multinational corporations. Jen, thanks for being here. Um, next, we have Hindu Ibrahim who is, in addition to being my personal fashion icon, um, an indigenous fellow with Conservation International. She is the coordinator for the indigenous women's and people's groups of Chad and the United Nations Sustainable Development Group Advocate. Hindu does incredible work advocating for the inclusion of indigenous rights and traditional knowledge in the climate agenda and has gratefully taken the, taken the chance to be here today. Thank you, Hindu. Um, and last, but certainly not least, we have Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the Minister of Energy and Environment for, for Costa Rica. Uh, Carlos Manuel was a former uh, Vice President for Conservation Policy at CI. <laughs> um, has been instrumental in setting up payment for ecosystem service schemes in Costa Rica, which contributed to the fact that Costa Rica has regained 1.1 million hectares of forest cover in the past two decades or so. Thank you for being here, Minister. Uh, 
Now, we have four main points that we would like to share with you today. I'm going to go through those uh, quickly and then ask our panelists a question to elaborate a little bit more on those points and specifically how to operationalize those points in preparation for the decade. So those points are, first and foremost, to center and support indigenous communities in preparing restoration plans. And Hindu is going to speak a little bit about this. Next is understanding the kinds of institutional frameworks that governments are operating under and looking to leverage the potential of natural regeneration, one of the most cost-effective kinds of restoration strategies out there, in order to reach scale. And Minister Rodriguez is going to share a little bit about that. Chris is going to talk a little bit about how we can actually work with land stewards, foresters, farmers, and other folks who are actively managing land to help them transition their practices to restorative, regenerative practices, in recognition that for many of us here, we don't actually do work on the land. It is those communities, those rural peoples, who are the ones making change directly. And lastly, Jennifer is going to share some insights on how to build coalitions, work with government, work with the private sector, work with local communities to focus uh, and synergize our efforts and our finances at a landscape scale in order to deliver the kinds of efforts that we really need to see happen in order to deliver on the decade. One number for you, 170 million hectares have been committed to restoration, committed to uh, be put under restoration by 2020, and yet we're only at 30 million hectares of forest land at least. So we're, right now we haven't quite delivered on the opportunities and all the potential of restoration worldwide. Now is our chance to actually do that. We spent the past two decades learning what works for restoration, learning the technical know-how, understanding how to weave together social, economic, and ecological principles to actually do this work, and this is an inflection point. If we don't do it in this decade, it's not going to get done. So now to, to our amazing panel. Minister Rodriguez, I'm going to start with you. If you could share a little bit about how you found working with governments, bringing together different government agencies to actually deliver concrete action on the ground, the kinds of practices that you would recommend governments worldwide start thinking about to implement that, and how you came across natural regeneration and are thinking about leveraging the potential of natural regeneration to meet global and national targets. Sure. I got two slides uh, to answer that question. I hope that they can come up, up there. So. Uh, We've been doing, in terms of restoration, a wonderful job from the technical per perspective, but an awful job from the political perspective. Awful, awful job from the political perspective. We don't understand what we need to do from the political point of view. And I would like to you know, bring to your intellectual appetite the following question, which I do ask myself like 10, 15 years ago. What is the difference within the ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture. Well, the classical division or response is the Minister of Agriculture is the one that generates production, works on production. The Minister of Environment works on conservation. And based on that fact, we try and think that we are going to restore all the degraded lands of the planet. Not going to happen. It will never happen if we keep on having this classical division. The minister, the minister or the Ministry of Agriculture, they work with domesticated biodiversity. The ministers of environment work with wild um, uh, biodiversity and the same landscapes. The day we governments and societies understand that that is their division that divide us a little within ourselves, ministers of environment and agriculture, we will do a huge uh, leap forward. The guys from agriculture, I, I like them. Not all of them, but I like them. <laughs> they tend to believe that their business is a business of chemistry. Their business is a business of biology, the same way we are. So uh, when we began to generate a agro-environment agenda for the landscape of our nations at the subnational, at the national level, we will see what you can see in that uh, map over there today. The Amazon is burning, Congo Basin countries are burning, Miko nations are burning, Sumatra is burning, Mesoamerica is burning, but what, oh, what is happening in Costa Rica? It's not burning at all. Look at the map. That is the image, the total image of uh, hot spots or fires uh, during this uh, dry season in Central, in Mesoamerica. You don't see fires as you see in the rest of Mesoamerica. Why? Because there's an, there's an agro, agro environment agenda. The, in Costa Rica, it doesn't make any sense to, turn, to burn down the forest at all. Can we see the next one? That's it, my last one. Look at that, uh, that uh, photo over there. What, what do you see in that photo? 
Mr. Moderator, what do you see in that photo? Natural regeneration. Totally. <laughs> totally. You don't, you don't see a Jaguar over there. Yeah, by the way, there's a Jaguar in the middle of a paved road. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, what you see is not natural re regeneration. You're close. This is gourmet carbon from Costa Rica. So I know uh, that picture was taken three years ago. Uh, what is a Jaguar doing in, in a paved road? A paved road means that there are humans uh, close by. What is a Jaguar doing in, in the middle of a paved road um, outside a protected area? The, the nearest protected area is uh, 25 kilometers. So I went to the place. I know where that place, I walked that, that place and uh, with maps. Well, it was aerial pictures because there was no satellite images. And I went back in time, 30 years ago, that same spot, that 30 years ago, it was an endless sea of grass and cows, that same site. Today, you don't see grass, you don't see cows, you see a nice canopy there, nice restoration, probably 65 species of trees per hectare, and you see a jaguar. <laughs> the jaguar is moving from one protected area to another protected area to a restored landscape that has been done because Costa Rica has created not only an agro-environment agenda where the Minister of Environment, myself, and the Minister of Agriculture, we don't fight, we work together. As a matter of fact, the Minister of, um, of Agriculture in Costa Rica fears a little bit the Minister of Environment, fears a little bit, <laughs> as opposed to the rest of the world where the Minister of Agriculture constantly bullies the Minister of Environment. So, um, uh, we, uh, the tax on fossil fuels and the payment for environmental services has been keen on restoring the landscape. Now we have a restored landscape, 1 point, um, million hectares, and that restoration has been done with high co-benefits. You see the jaguar, that's a co-benefit in terms of uh, biodiversity. Uh, the co-benefits are also in terms of social development because people are making a profit, you know, they're being paid $78 per hectare per year for keeping the forest and restoring the land. Uh, when the cost of opportunity of doing cattle ranching is between 42 and, and 50 dollars per hectare per year, so it doesn't make any sense to burn down the forest. Thank you, Minister. Mm. 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 And that's a good segue, I think, to my question for you, Hindu: is the role of people, local communities, and indigenous folks in particular in the restoration agenda. We've looked back at some of our projects and seen that the projects that are the most successful, that endure the longest and that benefit people most directly are the ones that really incorporate local knowledge and traditional knowledge from the very beginning. Could you share a little bit about your perspective on that and how we can work to do that in preparation for the decade? Sure, uh, good morning everybody. I'm so happy and humbled to be in this wonderful panel of CIA uh, fellows and uh, thank you for bringing this uh, really not comprehension between uh, ministries. So it seems the same for indigenous peoples. When we talk about the restoration, about the uh, land degradation, for us, it's always like degradation of our life, of our livelihood. I'm coming from Chad, where like actually now, two thirds of our land is getting more and more degraded because of advancement of the desert, but because of also of the climate change and loss of biodiversity. And people are moving from the north to the south. And then when they move to this place, it's exactly like conflict between the communities that fighting on the land, but also it's quick degradation of this land. So as coming from indigenous communities and then from these developing countries where the science is very limited. And you saw that in the previous panel, how much data that we do have in African countries or in all the less developing countries. So the only thing that we have to help restoration is indigenous people's traditional knowledge. And this way of life where we always know we have to live in harmony between peoples and all the rest of the species. So as an indigenous, we see always that we are part of the nature. We are only one species. And that's the important message every individual needs to understand. We are not peoples here and the nature here. We are one species of the nature as trees, as birds, as every insect who is in this land. So for us respecting it, it's just uh, restoring the land. So when, like my grandma observed all the weather casts, she observed like the insect, the birds displacement, the wind, and that helped us 
to see if the next coming year is going to be a rainy season. And then are we going to plant a new trees or we just to keep those who are already planted to get more water? So that's naturally for us. We cannot just to say this year we plant one million trees and next year two million trees. No, we plant it with the resources that's coming on for the next coming years in order to protect the already existed. So to do so for us is very important to link it with one thing. This is the land rights. Land rights, land tenure is very important where we talk everywhere about the restoration. So respecting their land rights of indigenous peoples is meaning you have to implement the FP, the free, prior, and informed consent through all the forest areas where is burning now and also the savannas when you see where exactly they respect the FP community from indigenous or local help to protect this area. This is the only one who are really protected. And that is recognized into the Paris Agreement, thanks, thankful to, to it, but also the IPCC report on land. So for me, I'm so humble on it. Why? Because my grandmom, who do not have a PhD on land restoration, now get it recognized into the IPCC or Paris Agreement because she's expert on her, her land. So why not we cannot move all from our land law in mind that's saying that we need to be expert on this before we store it to go to those who already restoring it for a centuries. Because those indigenous peoples who do not have PhDs know more better how they can restore sustainably the land. So, <laughs> for us, we wanted to share with you this strategy to restore this land. And that's why we have IPMG, who is the Indigenous Peoples Major Group, in collaboration with RRI. And thank you, now for GLF also to come in board. We developed 10 principles here. So then those 10 principles, who are called the gold standard, define exactly if you want to implement the FPIC, if you want to implement the knowledge, the rights of Indigenous Peoples. You follow it, you will do it better and you have indigenous peoples who are physically back home. And that's also why like CI doing a great work on this way, not because I'm senior fellow, of course I'm so happy about it, but no, because on the ground, what's happening, they are not do, doing the work as per sending the peoples there. They are just having the local peoples who are in this land, who are expert on those land. And then using the, tr the 10, principles we set up here to help them make it work. Let me end by saying we are talking about the decade of restoration. Decade is just like 10 years. 10 years is about tomorrow. If you have a child who is 10, he cannot go to the university yet. No, no way. So it's just like about this emergency I wanted to let you know. The land is burning everywhere. So 10 years is nothing. What we need is action. And those actions have to start by now. Because for us, it's not ju just replanting trees. It's not just restoring the biodiversity. It's about our life, all the human being life. It's about the survival of hundreds and millions of indigenous peoples that we wanted to restore, that we wanted to help. So we need to learn from indigenous peoples and make this solution very fast and implement it right now. Don't give us excuse that there is no money. Don't give us excuse that there is no political willing. It's not issue of political willing or money. There is no sustainable money without sustainable life in this planet. So that's why indigenous people are there to support and just to come with us in board and we can make it happen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hindu, for keeping us accountable and also providing a concrete road plan for what, what we can do today to start supporting indigenous folks in local communities. Um, speaking of which, I'm gonna to turn to you, Chris, as someone with a number of intersecting identities, to share a little bit about your farm um, and the kinds of things that decision makers can take now to support a transition to regenerative livelihoods. Hello, 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 okay. Honestly, I kind of just want to let her talk for another five minutes, but I guess he's not going to let me do that, so I'm going to have to try to follow that somehow. That's great. 
So <clears throat> I get asked a lot, because I do a lot of talks to school groups, universities, uh, things like that, and the number one question I get asked all the time is, Chris, what's the scariest thing about farming? Is it genetic engineering? Is it misapplication of pesticides? Is it cell-based meat? Is it weird stuff coming out of the lab that's called food? And I'll tell people what the scariest thing about agriculture is by doing a little experiment in here. Who in here is a farmer? Raise your hand. OK, so this is the largest number of hands as a proportion of the audience I have ever seen gone up. <laughs> I'll be in a room of 1,000 people, and not one hand will go up. The scariest thing about agriculture anywhere in the world is just the sheer smallness of the number of people who know how to do it, and the fact that the skills are not being transferred. Now, one of the things that, I, that does give me hope and that, that Hindu brought up is that indigenous people are finally starting to be listened to. We're starting to get away from the idea that restoration and conservation has to go hand in hand with dispossessing people from landscapes. Um, that practice is over a century old. It has extraordinarily racist roots in the idea that you know, the greatest places, for example, in America, Yosemite, the Sierras, the Grand Canyon, etc., that these places were somehow built, that they were somehow made beautiful and productive without the hand of people, that Native people had, you know, there was no way that Native people and Indigenous people could have been involved in that. We're starting to realize that that is nonsense, and finally we're starting to apply Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous ethics to the restoration of land and to food production. So that is an incredibly encouraging development especially since we're talking about the enormous amounts of land that need to be converted to, I'd say, maximized biological productivity so that farms can serve on a global scale as a carbon sink as we march towards a warmer and warmer climate. But the thing that's difficult about this, this proposition is we have millions and millions of hectares of land that need to be restored, but the question is, who's going to do it? Somebody has to be on the ground. Somebody has to get dirty. Somebody has to work those hours. And somebody has to just be in the pit and has to be the person on that front line growing food and restoring land at the same time. But right now, we have an exodus and a huge brain drain of farmers leaving the land. In the United States, they are aging out extremely rapidly. The average farmer right now is 60-something years old. And there are not enough young people coming in behind them to take their places. When I work on a farm, when I you know, work with, um, with the WOOF program, with various volunteer organizations, you have young people, you know, teenagers, people in their, in their early 20s, who really, really want to get their butts on that land and get to work. But the problem is that their dreams are having cold water poured all over them when they come face to face with the economic realities of what regenerative farming is today, which right now is a career for crazy people like me or people who are incredibly privileged, who can work without living wages, who can work 14 hours a day, who have deep social safety nets, who never have to worry about sleeping on the street. Given the amount of human capital that we need to come into farming and on the land to restore that land, we need everybody. And it needs to be a career that's as easy to get into as just about any other. I came into farming from tech. I got tired of sitting around all day and filling out TPS reports, so I decided I was going to do something different. For me, to become a software engineer was incredibly easy. I went to college. I majored in computer science. There were career fairs. I got to pick which employer I wanted. When I went to work, I didn't have to buy an office. I didn't have to buy a computer. I didn't have to fill out 1099s. I didn't have to do all this friggin' paperwork. I didn't have to be an entrepreneur. I could just apply my trade to what I was doing. For farmers, it is completely different. For a farmer, you have to be everybody. You have to be the Silicon Valley entrepreneur with the downside that you are never going to be a millionaire. Your work is going to wear you out. You're going to work 14 hours a day. You're going to lift things that weigh 200 pounds every single day. There's, you know, there, there's just all these downsides. There's the whole you know, entrepreneurial mindset with almost none of the benefits, and that is something that absolutely has to change. So for young people to be incentivized to get onto the land and do what I'm doing without freaking out our families and making my grandmother say, oh, you, you're crazy now. <laughs> Which is exactly what my 101-year-old grandmother said to me when I told her I was going back to the plantation, right? Um, <laughs> my mother's going to kill me when she finds out I said that. <laughs> there are four major things that we need. If there's leaders, donors, or whoever in this room who is able to 
you know, put some inertia behind this thing. There are four big things that we need. We need training, we need capital, we need access to land and tenure on that land, and we need better markets. And I'm gonna go through those one at a time as quickly as I can to stay under this five minute limit that I've probably already exceeded. <laughs> training, right now, anybody that wants to become a regenerative farmer, it's kind of a choose your own adventure thing and you have no idea who you're gonna be learning from, what values you're gonna be learning, there's no consistency across the field. There needs to be post-secondary education in regenerative agriculture, in permaculture, in multi, uh, what is it, multi-story agriculture, so that people who are coming out of educational systems have a baseline skill set that they can apply right away. For capital, my biggest problem right now is that I cannot get access to working capital that works on the timelines necessary for regenerative agriculture. If you want to grow corn, you want to grow wheat, you can start making revenue in you know, six months. If you want to start doing tree-based agriculture with you know, polycultures of chestnuts and hazelnuts and blueberries interspersed with grass-fed cattle and things like that, you're not going to see money for at least two and a half, three years. There is no bank that's going to, that's going to bankroll that. This, the returns do not match up with capitalism. Natural systems do not do hockey stick growth. You are not going to get your money back. Banks are never going to choose a regenerative farm in those long timelines over what they could get in other areas of the market. Never. That's why you see so much private capital pouring into every part of the food system except the part on the land, except for the farmers. It's going to the processors, it's going to the aggregators, the distributors, it's going to retail, it's even going to the freaking restaurants that fail half the time, but it is not going onto the farm. I have access to over 4,000 acres that I could put in food for us right now if somehow I could get a quarter million dollars in my pocket, but I can't. The best I can do is Kickstarter and raise maybe 40 grand. If we're going to work on the timelines that we need to restore systems as fast as we need to, we need to find the farmers that are out there doing the work and get as much money in their pockets as we can right now. Number three, <clears throat> tenure on land. In order to do tree-based agriculture and be able to re you know, get a return on that and have people able to make a living on that, we need to have leases that are 15 or 20 years long. It is one thing to get on a piece of land where somebody expects you to grow corn or wheat or some other annual crop and you can turn around in a year and be off that land, but with tree-based agriculture, with the kind of agriculture we need to turn farmland into a carbon sink, the way that the sustainable development goals demand, we need longer leases. We need access to public land. If there are people out here who can do leases on parks, national parks, state parks, any kind of conserved land, make that available to people who have the training and the track record to turn those spaces into productive spaces, we need that land. And last but not least, we need better markets. Because right now, I spend 30 freaking hours a week doing farmers markets where people who are in the farm to table movement in the regenerative ag space, we're being outsold at the grocery store by conventional agriculture 400 to one. We are never going to make a dent. We are never going to be able to balance out extractive agriculture with regenerative agriculture if we do not have parity in the markets. If we are competing with Cisco and US Foods and ConAgra with farmers markets, there's, you know, there's, there's just no leverage. So if there are any people out there that can put money into markets, into creating an ethical and indigenous valued commodities market for, regenerative, for regener the products of regenerative agriculture, that is one of the biggest things that we need right now so that the people who get on the ground can actually have a market, a sizable market, where they can produce as much as they can on as much land as they can and make a living. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. I met Chris my second day of work in D.C. and thought that I'd found God. Um, <laughs> Jen, you might have the hardest question of the lot, um, and that is, having heard from government, having heard from local actors, having heard from indigenous communities, how do you think about building the kinds of partnerships that include all these actors in addition to the private sector, large-scale private sector actors, to catalyze action and synergize funding at a landscape scale? Thanks, Nico. All right. Are we uncomfortable yet? That was amazing. Okay, so I know it's right before lunch, but we're going to continue to be uncomfortable for a little bit. So um, I don't know about you, but I'm sure many of you were here this week, and we're a little bit underwhelmed by the results of the commitments that were made. 
Some were big and bold, some by, by companies coming out and, and making some, some bold statements. But let's get real. How do we get from the corporate boardroom to the biome? This is our fundamental problem. How do we achieve the goals that Greta has set out for us and not let her down and the generation down by empty promises? How do we ensure that the goals of this new decade of promises and restoration are fulfilled? Well, we gotta get uncomfortable. We gotta do something that often our sector doesn't do. We need to admit and recognize when we failed. And we need to learn from those failures. And I'm sure all of you recognize the fact that 2020 is just on the horizon and the New York Declaration on Forests, a fantastic, wonderful set of agendas, we have not succeeded. In fact, the restoration goals, we only did less than 20% of those. The 53 companies that came out and pledged for no net deforestation, not one of them is gonna achieve that goal. That doesn't mean the goals were bad. It's good that we have this visionary approach. We need to have that. But the reality is there's a huge gulf between the corporate boardroom and the CEO's proclamations and what really happens on the ground. We know that it actually takes boots on the ground to make this happen, and it creates a need for a holistic approach. You have to have production, protection, and governance, as well as long-term finance in the same place in a holistic manner to actually create long-term change. And most importantly, as discussed here today, it takes radical partnerships. We have to get out of our comfort zones, working with local communities, governments, companies, et cetera. Now, this is nice to say, but Nico asked me for some examples. So I'm gonna give you one in the interest of time. I'm gonna focus on an area that we're all talking about right now, which is the Brazilian Amazon. So Conservation International and many partners, such as the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, and others that I'll mention in a second, are engaging in what is the most ambitious to date tropical reforestation effort ever attempted. 73 million trees across 30,000 football or soccer fields, for those of you in the US. Um, and this is a big, big, big task. When we, we first thought about this, we said, all right, how are we gonna do this? Is this another empty promise? Well, we're doing it. It is hard and it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of focus. But through these partnerships that I mentioned, as well as some unusual ones, we're also working directly with the government of Brazil, the Brazil Biodiversity Fund, FOMBIO, and the unusual one is a, a, a rock concert called Rock in Rio, the largest concert in the world, um, attracts over a million fans. In fact, it just started last night. They wanna go carbon neutral. And this is such a big concert that Drake actually performed last night. So for those of you that don't know who Drake is, <laughs> my 12-year-old tells me that it's a really big deal. <laughs> so the most important partner in all of this are clearly, as has been said here today, indigenous people. The indigenous partners that we have in this region are critical. In fact, they're the ones teaching us. So Hindu's grandma is the one that's teaching us on the ground in Brazil, people just like her. In fact, we're using the techniques for ref uh, reforestation and restoration in this area from the indigenous uh, techniques, and it's called muvuca. And muvuca, I understand, is a Brazilian Portuguese slang that means kind of a wild party. So this wild party of seeds is used, has been used for generations by local people to actually restore lands near tropical forest and really plant the seeds and walk away and let nature do what nature does best. But also ensuring that local communities have the incentive to keep those forests growing and standing. So while this is important, we're showing that not only is this a great way to do reforestation and restoration, it's also very economical. We're able to demonstrate that by doing this, we can actually reduce the cost of reforestation and restoration by two thirds and increase the number of regenerated trees by over 16 times a typical tropical reforestation project. And most importantly, over 120,000 people are benefiting through jobs um, and other ecological benefits. 
So our goal is to not make this just a site level project. Planting trees is great. But at the end of the day, we gotta scale this. And we gotta make sure that these lessons can be used outside of these communities. But the one thing that I've learned, so I'm an economist. So, you know, we, we look at things kind of simply, let's be honest. We want to have, we're always talking about ROI and high return on investment and how do we get to scale and how do we ensure the most, the greatest uh, level of efficiencies. Well, as I've learned from my team on the ground, as we heard earlier today, drone planting is great when there's no people around, but you have to give people jobs. If people are not invested in doing this by hand or using, in the case of Brazil, we're also using uh, soy trucks that were used to plant soy in a way to spread the seeds in a very efficient way, hiring those individuals to do tree planting. That is critical for our success. If we don't have that and we only do things looking at pure cost benefit, drone, very efficient mechanisms, we're actually never gonna succeed. We have to ensure that there's local jobs for local people on the ground. So we need to build an economy around reforestation. And if we don't do this, our goals for the decade of ecological restoration will fail. We will fail, fail Greta, and we will fail the generation that she represents. And I don't want that on my conscience, and I hope you don't either. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Oh, I joined CIA about a year ago because it's a 30-year-old organization that wants to make us uncomfortable. So I'm grateful for Jen, our president, for setting the stage and modeling what that can actually look like. Now, if we could quickly pull up the results of the Slido um, to see who's in the room. We don't have an opportunity to field questions directly from the audience, but we wanted some degree of audience interaction. Let's see if this can, can come up. Maybe not, just technology is not the silver bullet, <laughs> as we've learned. Do we have it on? Okay, here we go. Question for you, panelists. The largest group of actors that we have in the room right now are research and academia. From your perspective, how can they get involved right now to help set the stage for the decade of ecosystem restoration? Hindu, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm always so excited when you say, like, oh, there is research academia or there is modern knowledge. So then, as indigenous person with the indigenous people's knowledge, I think all kind of knowledge system are together. So having the research people in the room is a good opportunity to tell them that the research is beyond only like developing a report paper. So how you can collaborate with the indigenous peoples, local communities, those who are living in the ground, but who have the knowledge now, for us, we are calling it also our science knowledge. How we can put it together, and that can help us restoration. Let me give you an example. Oh, my favorite project I work on it is a 3D participatory mapping. So this mapping, you need to use a geographical information coming directly from geography, and you need to use a science knowledge coming from the GPS, coming from the biological knowledge, and all the science technical knowledge that you do have. So when you take those knowledges and you go to the community and you put it together with the indigenous people's knowledge, you figure out that the map you can build on the natural resources is completely different than the one you take from satellite or than the one you take from a photographer because you have the detail of knowledge, where will be the exactly trees who can conserve the forest, where you can get the water that's shrinking, but can get also restored. So you cannot see those knowledges only by satellites. You cannot see them when you are there for the research on, on one year or two years. You can only learn from those knowledge where you are with this community. And you can only improve it when you put the science knowledge and indigenous knowledge all together. So I can say there is a big opportunity and having them in the room is really a big opportunity to see how the science knowledge and indigenous knowledge can be derived together, side by side, not opposite. And then believe me, you don't need to have one plus one, it's two, because indigenous knowledge is best in oral knowledge, but very concrete. 
And this example is here because when we project a PowerPoint, we always like the technique, oh, it's not working, okay, we move. What, where are we going back? We're going back to our mouth and tongue and talk. It's oral, right? So your oral knowledge cannot fail you. Your science knowledge, you build it yourself. So it can fail you somewhere. And then if you go to the community, you have your science knowledge, you need electricity to branch, you need internet, you need whatever. But your traditional knowledge is never fail you because you observe it from all the elements who are uh, surrounded you. So how we can make all the two together, understand that, and it can drive us to a right and better solution and quick one together. Thank you. Thank you, Hindu. So we're at time. I think we all have our marching orders. So I want to thank you for being engaged audience members and our panelists for taking the time to be here today. Thank you.